Good morning, folks. Welcome. So glad you can join us for our online message today. This is number two in our series on Nehemiah. So if you haven't listened to the first one yet, you may want to go back and watch that one first. Now, when I was 21, I moved to Belfast. Big, big life decision, big change. I packed everything I owned into a backpack and off I went and started working there and fairly quickly actually joined a a Christian organisation called Logos Ministries and began working for them full time. So this was really new. I was 21 and just starting to 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 explore, you know, what God had called me to in the services there. It was an interesting time, 1996, and um, uh, all sorts of things were happening in Belfast. But in the mission organisation there, my job was to create Bible study materials, which I loved. I knew the Bible, knew it well and loved creating the, the courses and the questions and everything like that. What I found quite soon as I, after I started working there, that they were quickly going to give me other responsibilities to look after the building and open that and do some admin and quite strangely for me work with two of our volunteers who were elderly ladies okay I have to admit I was 21 they were retired I don't know if they were elderly but to a 21 year old they appeared to be these were elderly ladies who didn't really know how to do word processing yet alone figure out how to use the new computers Apple computers that we had in the building anyway a few weeks later I had my first kind of appraisal informal chat with my boss and she said to me Bethany you're doing great you know you're doing fantastic at the bible teaching and creating the materials your commitment is a grade A I'm giving you all for that your attention to detail is you know I'll give you a B you're you're doing brilliantly things to work on but that's fantastic but Bethany your managing of our volunteers is terrible I'm sorry you get an F you're failing at that and apparently they didn't like my cheese sandwiches either um, but that's okay. I realised I was 21, had a lot to learn. And that's true, isn't it, in life? You you develop the skills and the talents that you're going to use for working with people and doing jobs later on, but also that God is going to use you for. And today we are looking at, in this series in Nehemiah, a man who was highly skilled, a lot of talents, although not necessarily going to be used where he anticipated So turn in your scriptures with me to Nehemiah and uh, we are looking at chapter two. Remember last week we looked at how Nehemiah was born and bred in the Babylonian Empire. He's a high ranking servant to the Persian king, but also a man of God whose heart was broken by the news that Jerusalem was a pile of rubble and the survivors were barely hanging on. So join with me in chapter two. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will the journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat 
and the Horon the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Now, he has spent four months in prayer and fasting, mourning and seeking the Lord. But now Nehemiah senses that the time to speak to the king has come. But how's he going to do it? How will he get the king's attention? Somehow he needs to initiate that conversation. And so he does something forbidden. Instead of entering the king's presence with a smile and an amenable countenance, because that's what everybody in the court did. I mean, you don't bring your problems to work with you. The king is the king and he expects everybody to be smiling, pleasant, jovial, happy all the time. But rather, Nehemiah, instead of presenting a facade, he's going to show the depth of sorrow on his face going to show his real self and see if the king notices and if that works. Well, the king does. The king does and turns around and says to him, why are you so sad? Now, you're obviously not ill, so this must be, it must be something of the heart. Something's troubling you, Nehemiah. Verse two, Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. Nehemiah is terrified. Now, remember, as we heard last week, he is this clever, good looking, rich guy at the top of his game. And he is terrified. Why? Well, firstly, because he knows being sad in the presence of the king can be a sackable offence. So, I mean, if this moment goes wrong, Nehemiah loses everything. He loses his job. He loses where he lives. He'll be out on the streets. And that's the, you know, at the best. Secondly, I believe Nehemiah is terrified because he has made himself vulnerable by showing the sorrow on his face, but he's about to reveal an even deeper level of vulnerability. Let's just pause at this point and think through vulnerability. What is it? Why is it both scary and so incredibly powerful? Well, vulnerability is when you let down your barriers. You know, we talked about the walls of Jerusalem last week, didn't we? And how they protected people from the enemy. They created a sense of identity and community. Um, you know, the importance of the walls and the importance of the gates. The gates where you could let people in for trade, for um, development, for uh, and you could also get out. Well, if we're thinking of vulnerability, if we're thinking of this in the, pra in the physical, the metaphorical, as well as the physical, it's a bit like having gates in your walls. You know, you set aside your ego, you open the gate and you let somebody come in. Come into who you are. Come in and see the real you. And this is so countercultural in so many ways. There is a real social pressure to be strong, independent. No, nope, I'm fine, thank you. I can do things on my own. Yep, no worries here. Except that actually, maybe we're not doing fine. Maybe we can't do things on our own. And sometimes with the right people in the right place, actually we need to be vulnerable. Because it is in those moments of vulnerability that we are truly known. And let's others move in close, move in close with empathy, move in close and realise maybe they can be vulnerable, move in close and encircle you with their care and their love and say so that together you can work through these things together. Some of you know the story of my dad when he became ill. I was eight years old and within three weeks he went from being the strongest, fittest man in the village who could run faster than I could cycle to being in a wheelchair and unable to snap a Kit Kat in half. You know, and I remember as a child being there and him calling to me, B, B, I need you. B, please, could you put my socks on for me? And I would sit there on the floor and roll the socks up and put them on feet that didn't work properly and didn't move. And, and I would help dress him. Well, well, for my dad, this meant that he wasn't blocking me out. You know, he wasn't allowing his ego or his pride or his shame to block me out. But he was asking, Bethany, I need some help. Will you come and help me? He was opening the gates of his life. And for my dad, of course, he didn't just do that so that I provided the physical help that he needed. But my dad knew, knew the importance of opening his gates emotionally and spiritually. 
And over the next years, he always was there and he welcomed me in. And we became very, very close. And I learned more from my dad about faith and the Christian life and working through tough times and being there in the joy and working together in faithfulness than from anywhere else. And as many of you know, we've made incredibly, we've remained incredibly close. And now over 40 years there is of the trust between us. And even though this past summer he has been pretty ill, it was my dad and my mum. They were the first people that I turned to when things got tough for me this summer. Why? Because the relationship that we've built is one of trust. I know that I'm safe with them when I'm vulnerable. And they know that they're safe with me when they're vulnerable. And so our relationship is incredibly strong. And so often people mistake vulnerability with weakness. Actually, it's not. It takes courage to be vulnerable because it's a risk. I mean, especially at the beginning when you don't really know people. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you as well as I have experienced that moment when we've opened up and only to have somebody look at us in horror at what we've said or um, or even worse, start mocking and scorning us for how we feel or, or actually get so frightened of our openness that they run away and don't talk to you again, you know? So those who actually are afraid and live in fear, they won't take the risk to be vulnerable. That's why being vulnerable is such a courageous act. Now, of course, because it is a risk, it's always wise to have some an element there of wisdom as to choose who to be vulnerable with and when to be vulnerable. I mean, come on, hey, not everybody wants to hear everything. You just don't do the oversharing stuff with everyone, do you? But equally, if we don't have those really strong relationships made strong because of vulnerability, then we're going to be weak. The Bible talks all the time about the the three corded rope, you know, of of being standing one person and a second person and Jesus sending out the disciples two by two so that they had each other to work with. And those close bonds of love that's needed for that require and are born in moments of vulnerability. Jesus, as always, is our example. I mean, people came to him with their vulnerability. They opened up with their physical pain or their loneliness, their hurt, their confusion, their isolation with everything, you know, that they came and asked him, will you touch me? And Jesus, Jesus had compassion Time and time again, we read that. He had compassion on him, her, and touched them and was there. But Jesus himself was vulnerable. Do you remember the story of when his friend Lazarus died? In that verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. He poured out his grief. He mourned with Martha and Mary and the neighbours, and they were astounded. They saw that this guy really cared. He loved Lazarus too. He was vulnerable. He took Peter, James and John up the mountain one time and revealed an aspect of himself, his true self, his God divineness in the transfiguration. Do you remember that? Making himself vulnerable. Another time there in the upper room, he washed the disciples feet, humbling himself as he took on the very vulnerable role of a servant. Have you ever washed somebody's feet? It's actually vulnerable both ways. The person who's doing the washing and the people who take their socks and shoes off and let somebody wash their feet. Again, Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane as he begged his disciples, will you watch and pray with me? As he wrestled with the knowledge of the horror that was to come. And of course, on the cross, that moment of complete vulnerability, naked, hanging up there, being crucified. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was so vulnerable. And yet, when you look at those moments, do we judge him as weak? No. In fact, those incredible real moments of vulnerability of him being truly himself emphasise what a strong man he was to be so open, open with his disciples, open with us. And it gives us permission to be real, to share and be vulnerable with God and with others when we need help and support, because no one can get through this life alone. 
Strength comes in community. That's why the church is described as a body with all the parts working together. Or as a family where you've got mothers and sisters and brothers, uh, uh, mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, you know, and the children there and everyone loves and shares with each other. How about you? What are your relationships like? Who are you really real with? Your marriage will only be as strong as your hearts are open to each other. Your best friendships are those that stand the test of time, are being there for each other through all the hard times as well as the good. And if you've kept yourself back and if you've not shared of yourself with others because of fear, do you really want to continue living like that? Or could it be that perhaps this morning God is inviting you to open up, to open up? So back to Nehemiah, because this is what he does. Now, OK, he's not going to be growing a deep personal relationship with the king, but he realises that if he wants the king to give permission for help to be offered to Jerusalem and all the people there, he is going to have to be vulnerable. He's going to have to show his deep personal pain so that the king can think, hmm, maybe this situation is serious. Maybe I need to do something. And so he's terrified. I mean, this powerful king is as likely to choose cruelty as graciousness. I mean, he might get furious and then who knows what his actions will be. And if those two reasons aren't enough to be afraid, you know, the fact that he's going to be sad, which you're not allowed to be, and then make himself vulnerable, there's a third reason. Because it wasn't long ago, only about six years previously, when the work on Jerusalem was halted by an edict of the king. This king, that Nehemiah is about to ask for reversal of that policy. OK, so this king six years ago said, no, all work in Jerusalem has to be halted. And now Nehemiah is going to come in and say, um, actually, could we do some work in, in Jerusalem? I mean, if the king takes offence, Nehemiah may lose his head before the end of the day. So he has a right to be afraid. In fact, it'd be rather worrying if he wasn't. Again. Where are we at this moment, this moment in time? Are we living in fear, fear of being vulnerable, fear of what others might think of you? Or perhaps you're facing a difficult situation that has you awake at night with fear and worry, maybe a health issue or your work situation. You know, I've been speaking to a few people in the past couple of days who are going to be hugely affected by the cut in universal credit and the increase in national insurance tax that was announced this week. Hugely. And there was another single mum who, who I was speaking to who was sharing just her despair at finding a proper permanent home for her and her two-year-old. She has no idea when she'll find a home for them both. Or perhaps your fear is something from the past, a shadow that's constantly hovering over you. You know, and that kind of fear, well, it usually grows, doesn't it, in our minds until it becomes all consuming and takes over. It's a fear that can paralyze us, causing us to not take the next step just in case things get even worse. But it is at this moment of intense fear that we need to be honest, honest with ourselves, honest with God. Take a deep breath and find the courage in the midst of it, a courage that is based on the truth of scripture, where Jesus says, do not be afraid, I am with you. And that's what Nehemiah did. You know, the preceding four months of prayer and fasting meant that his faith was bigger than his fear. And this is the moment. Verse three. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? He spits it out. Out it comes, this burden that he's been carrying. And he says, this is what it is. And, and then I bet he stopped breathing as he waited for the king's next words. Would it be a roar of anger or would it be an ice cold demissal or would it be a shaming cruel silence leading to days if not weeks of insecurity as Nehemiah said oh did I blow it am I now going to lose my job is all of this but we read verse four the king said to me what is it you want what is it you want oh phew what a relief thank goodness for that no nope, I'm not losing my head today the king is now interested and opens Wow. 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 
This is just amazing. And so Nehemiah, he's not stopping yet. He shoots up another quick prayer. Then I pray to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. You know, I love this. Isn't this a situation that we can already readily relate to? You know, those arrow cares, God, God, prayers, God, God, I just need you just this moment. And he begins to make his requests to the king. You know, God there, God is our way maker, our miracle worker, our promise keeper. And Nehemiah's prayers have been based in the promise that God said, if you repent and turn back to me, look at it in chapter one, I will gather the remnant from even the ends of the earth and I will bring them back to my place where I am worshipped. And this is what Nehemiah believes in. And this is the moment. By the end of the meal, approval has been given. Nehemiah is going to be released from his duties as the wine steward for a certain period of time to return to Jerusalem and rebuild a city. Hmm. It's quite curious. So he's going from wine steward to wall builder. Hmm. In, in, interesting transferable skills there, maybe. I mean, oh, I guess. I mean, he's, he knows how to serve. He's been serving in the court and in particular choosing, buying, serving wine. Um, but now he's going to be building walls, you know. So some of the skills, I don't know, I guess he's a planner um, and he can maybe strategize. He knows how to use, how to work a team, which is going to be good because he's going to have to communicate, isn't he? And um, yeah. But he's got a he's got a steep learning curve ahead of him if he's going to be building those walls. But Nehemiah, he's not wasted the last four months in the last four months of praying that planning and strategy. Betty had a check checklist. Don't you just love a checklist? Betty had one of those, you know, that's come into play. And so he goes back to the king and he says, OK, king, this is this is what I'm going to need. And God turns his favour, turns his favour on Nehemiah. Nehemiah has put in the months of prayer. And now his, with his faith and his skills and his planning in it all works here together. Because if he had been, if he had been too afraid to speak, if he'd been too afraid to make himself vulnerable, if he had chosen to live in fear instead of courage, this would never have happened. But actually, this is the moment this is the moment where what has gone on before and what is going to happen crystallizes. And he gets permission from the king, permission to go with a time frame. He gets cooperation from all the other officials that are going to provide safe passage to get there. He's getting permission that he can gain all the resources from the king that he needs to build. And he's getting protection. You know, he's got the army officers who are there. He gets it all. I just love this. I just love this. We've got prayer and planning. And when he gets it all in place, he sets off on the four month journey to Jerusalem, where the next part of the hard work is going to begin and where, of course, he's going to face opposition, which we'll get back to in future weeks. Now, we know the end of the story. We know what was going to happen. But Nehemiah didn't. And on this day, in the presence of the king, he, he had no, he had no certainty of what was going to happen. Instead, he's obedient. He's obedient to God. And because he's obedient to God, Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. The well-being of the Jewish community will be restored. And as we'll see later, there is going to be a revival of faith and spiritual integrity. But it begins here. You know, it begins in the spiritual arena with heartbreak and prayer and fasting. It begins in the emotional arena of facing the fear of loss, rejection, and, and the risks that come with vulnerability. And it begins here in the practical arena of planning and preparation. What about us? What is God saying to us at this moment in time, to us as a church at Rosedale, but also to us as individuals? I believe that for many of us, God is saying, I want to rebuild, I want to restore, I want to renew and revive in you something. Will you start with me? Will you start in the heartbreak and prayer? Will you start with me in the emotional 
of being open and vulnerable? Will you start with me planning and preparing now for what I've got for the future? Because it's going to be amazing. And you know what? We can do that without fear because God is with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, the Lord of Nehemiah, the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. God, you, you, you are big and you're amazing. And when you call, you provide. Father, but you ask from us, you ask from us courage and you ask from us to prepare ourselves and you ask for us to put in the work. And Lord, wherever it is that, that you are taking us now, and for each individual listening to this today, Father, I pray for them that by your Holy Spirit, you will work on their hearts, that you will show them where you are guiding them in the future, where you want to rebuild, restore and renew and revive in their lives. And start it today, I pray. May they have the courage to take the risks needed for the next step in their journey with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, folks. Thanks for being with us. Look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.